Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it is a blessing to you. So, um, I want to get into, we've been in a series called Supporting Cast, and, and the basis of it is this, the Bible is the story of God, it's about God. It focuses on God, it's written by God to show us who God is, and in view of that, in light of that, tells us who we are and how we respond accordingly. But that when we read the Bible sometimes, um, we can feel like it's about the people of the Bible, or we can feel like we read into it like it's about me, like i got to look through this because the Bible is all about me, it's about my guide on earth. And although there is truth in that, God makes it clear his plan, how he built things to function so that we can learn and gain wisdom from that. The, the goal of scripture is that we would have a clear understanding of who God is, how much we need a relationship with him, and how that happens. You got it? There's a lot to learn from the, the people in Scripture. There's a lot for us to understand about who we are in Scripture. Um, but it's God pointing to God that he's the main character. He's the hero. And, and he works through people in all kinds of ways, but it's for his glory that it would point back to him. And so we've been in this series called Supporting Cast. And what we mean by that is there's phenomenal people in Scripture that God uses to do such things that we just talked about. Um, and, and we want to learn from them and hopefully understand who God is more through their stories. Um, but we want to also realize that they're not the main focus of Scripture, that their God is. And so we started kind of at the beginning, well, not kind of at the beginning, at the beginning. We started with Adam and Eve. And, and then we worked from there. We, we talked about Noah. The last three weeks, we've talked about uh, Abraham, and today we're going to jump into the story of Isaac, who is Abraham's son. And, and if you've been here um, and got to experience us kind of slowly walking through the big picture story of Scripture, the, the meta narrative, and, and um, what, what God's doing in the, in the big picture by looking at these little stories, then hopefully you're following along with where we're at. If you haven't, that's okay. You're going to learn about Isaac today and how awesome God is in his life. And I would recommend going and listening to the other messages. Not because I've done anything um, great. I'm not great in and of myself. Basically what I did is just told you the story that's already in Scripture and read it to you. So thank you for allowing me to do so. Um, I plan on doing the same thing today. So um, let me, I want to pray again because um, we're in church. That's what we do. We pray and ask God to, to move. And so God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, we believe that we are here on purpose. God, even if people don't believe they're here on purpose, I believe that every single person is here because you want them to be here, to spend time with you and your people, to praise your name and hear your word, that you would transform their lives, our lives, all of our lives. God, from the inside out, our hearts would be transformed, our minds would be transformed. God, that you would be making us more like Christ Jesus. Huh. God, I pray that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see your goodness your grace, your mercy, your power, in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, if you have a Bible with you, awesome. Um, if you don't, that's okay. It'll be on the screen. If you don't have a Bible, uh, make sure and talk to one of the ushers after service. We have a box of Bibles here, and we would love to put one in your hands um, so that you can follow along if you'd like to. Uh, but if you would go to Genesis chapter 25, if you have a Bible with you. Genesis uh, 25, we'll start in verse 19 here in just a moment. <clears throat> An interesting thing happened as I uh, studied the story of Isaac. I've read through his story before several times. Um, Isaac is a significant person in Scripture as from here on out through Scripture, God will be referred to as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And so he gets to be one of those three names in this, this family line that is point to as, as the God we worship is, was this guy's God. And so with that being said, uh, Abraham, we took three weeks on because there's this amazing story. And I feel like we could have spent more time because the Bible tells us so much about who Abraham is and what that looks like. Next week, we'll start um, 
telling the story and talking about Jacob. And we're going to spend a couple weeks on him because there's just so much about his story. An interesting thing happened as I studied about Isaac this week. We know he's significant um, because of God's plan, the way he works through him and, and to work out his plan. Um, but an interesting thing happened. Some of the most significant stories we understand or we know about Isaac actually have a lot more to do with Abraham or with Jacob. There's not much standalone material for Isaac. So we're going to look at what is there today and see what we can gain from that and how God uh, just chooses to reveal himself in the story of Isaac and then how it would apply to us. But I just want to let you know that it was an interesting thing to, to kind of study through, uh, knowing he's a big deal in Scripture, but realizing there's not a whole lot of unique material just for himself. So uh, here we are in Genesis 25, starting in verse 19. It says this, This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac. I'm going to stop right there for just a second. Uh, We've talked about in the last, uh, specifically last week, um, that Isaac is Abraham's son. It's not his first son. He actually had a a, a son with his wife's servant, um, and his name was Ishmael. And God said, I'm going to bless you um, through your son and uh, through your son Isaac um, that that your wife Sarah is going to have. And Abraham says, why don't you just do it through Ishmael? I already have a kid. It seems like the easier thing to do would, to, to, would be to bless the one I already have instead of trying to make my, uh, I, I'm old and my wife's old, trying to make that happen. So he tries to reason with God and God says, that's great, I'll bless your son Ishmael, but my covenant I will establish. God says, I have a plan that's greater than yours. <laughs> it's good for us to know. God has plans that are greater than our own. We play a part, but it's in his plan. We have a small part that we play. It doesn't mean it's insignificant. It is significant. We should play our part. We we have a role that we play in this greater plan, but his plan is greater than ours. And sometimes we just have to kind of go, okay, God, I know you're up to a plan that's greater than mine, even if I don't understand exactly why it would play out that way. So what we see here is he says, no, I'm going to bless your wife, and through Isaac I'm going to establish this covenant. And so the next year we see that Sarah gives birth Um, to Isaac, and God shows that he is faithful to his promises, Isaac is born. And then later on, when Isaac gets a little bit older, God tests his dad, Abraham, by telling him to go sacrifice Isaac. That's how we get introduced to Isaac. They're going to establish the covenant through this son, Isaac. That's awesome. God's faithful. Here's Isaac. And then Isaac, when we kind of get to know him a little bit more, and the first time he talks in Scripture is when when he says, Father, we have the wood, we have the fire, where's the lamb? When when his dad is being faithful to God, God knew the whole time that he would not allow this to happen, that Isaac would not be sacrificed in that kind of way. Um, But this is how we get introduced to Isaac from the line of Abraham, and we're going to see more of how, why that's significant um, later on here. And Isaac was 40 years old. When he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Aram. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Okay. <clears throat> I want to tell you this story. I'm not going to get into it. But in the chapter before, in Genesis chapter 24, it's pretty cool. So Abraham is the, the forefather of all of our faith. In fact, he's uh, considered righteous because he believes that God is who he says he is and will do what he says he'll do. Um, just like how our righteousness isn't from the works that we do, but put in our faith in Christ Jesus who's done all the work. So um, that's who Abraham is. And Abraham has his son Isaac. And, and Abraham's getting old and, and um Considering the fact that Isaac's going to marry, he's going to have children, he looks at his his highest servant, the one most in charge of things, and he says, swear to me that you will not allow my son to get a wife from these Canaanites. We live in this place among a foreign people. We're a foreign people in this place, and I don't want my son to get a wife from here. So swear to me that you will go and get a wife for my son from my country that I came from, from my relatives, from my people. So the, the servant swears to Abraham that he will do that. He, puts, uh, he gets 10 camels, puts all kinds of goods on them, and then heads off to Abraham's family's uh, place of origin. And, and so he, he goes to this, this place, um, to the city of Nahor, which is um, actually Abraham's brother. And so he heads to the, the city of Abraham's brother um, around the relatives to go get a wife for Isaac. 
who we're going to find out is Rebecca. And in doing so, he shows up there, and it's pretty awesome. He shows up with all these goods on the camels, and he basically asks God, he said, Lord, make my trip successful. And God, if you could, while I'm out here, I'm going to stop by this well. And when I ask um, one of these women for water, the one that, that says, okay, here's some water. Why don't, you, you know, why don't you rest while I also water your camels? Let her be the one. Right? Like, I don't want to search the whole area. I'm just going to sit by this well. If you could just bring her here, that would be awesome. So what happens is, is in the evening when all the women are coming out to the well to get water, this woman, Rebecca, comes, and, and, and she's getting water, and it, the Bible says that she was very beautiful and had, had never slept with a man. It's this hardworking, very beautiful virgin, which is awesome, which is really, I mean, what parents hope their daughters grow up to be, what parents hope their sons will find that, that it, she's not set apart for any other man. She is, will be singly for him, that she works hard and is appealing to the eye. I mean, maybe I should say every son is hoping that their parents go find them one. <laughs> like, so, so what happens is, what happens is Abraham's servant sees her, asks for water, she waters the camels, and he's watching her. He's assessing what's going on. He asks who she is and what family line she's from, and he finds out, like, her grandpa is Abraham's brother. So like this is the family I'm supposed to get someone from and she's beautiful and she's hardworking and she did what I asked God to have somebody do. And so he tells her, this is why I'm here. And it, the Bible says that he gives her a nose ring and two gold bracelets, a gold nose ring and two gold bracelets. I don't know how your mind works when you read scripture. But instantly, the way my mind works is I go like, a nose ring? What kind of nose ring? Is it in the middle? Is it on the outside? Does something have to be pierced or is it like a tension set thing? You don't do that? Cool. Um, so anyway, she goes back to her family. Specifically, her brother comes running out to meet this servant and say, hey, what's going on here? You gave these things to my, to my sister. What's happening? And he says, there's a place at my house that you can come and we'll take care of your camels and you can come stay. And so the servant comes to their house and they have all this food spread out for him to eat. And he says, I will not eat until I get to tell you why I'm here. How awesome. What a great servant. Like, it's not about me. I came here with a job. And, and when that job is done, when I tell you why, I'll, why I'm here, I'll eat. So he tells them where he comes from, who Abraham is to him and and what that looks like, why he's on this mission, and, and asks, can I take Rebecca with me to come be my master's son's wife? And realizing that this guy is blessed and that Abraham is blessed and what he's come to ask, um, they give him permission to do so. And it's cool because the servant throughout this like bows down and worships God because he sees God's hand throughout it. And then they say, like, why don't you stay a while? And he says, no, I don't have time for that. I came here. I'm on a mission. Um, I'm, it's time to go. So he takes Rebecca, her nurse, and her attendants. So they, they're doing okay, too. <laughs> he, he takes them with him after giving Rebecca all these blessings from Abraham and giving the family all these blessings. Um, takes Rebecca back with him. And she becomes Isaac's wife. And the Bible says that Isaac loves her. So we, we see um, so far that he is the, the son. Isaac is the son of Abraham. And, and he's the husband of Rebekah who is, through this amazing story, becomes his wife. We saw that in two verses somehow. But here we go. Let's keep moving. If you're taking notes, right? Twins. <clears throat> Twins. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. So now they're married. They've been married almost 20 years, 19 years. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and clearly he answered yes. And his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. The babies, how, how cool is that? So they've been trying to get pregnant. They can't get pregnant. He prays to God, and now she gets pregnant with twins. 
the babies jostled each other within her, struggled with each other within her. Um, There's conflict between these brothers that we'll see later that happened in the womb. Like these guys were getting at each other before they were even out. And, and, uh, And she said, why is this happening to me? Or why do I live? They must have really been fighting in there. That's a big struggle going on early. And she says, like, this is so crazy. Like, why? Why? So this blessing that she couldn't get pregnant, there's prayer. The answer to prayer is that she would get pregnant with twins. And even with the blessing of these twins, there's this struggle of, like, why have you done this to me? And so she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, that's awesome, two nations are in your womb. And two people from within you, or and yeah, and two peoples from within you will be separated. So there's this conflict that'll happen outside even after this. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger, which is not normal um, in that time in history. And even now, like the big brother tends to be the one that gives the noogies, right? Like they, they tend to be the one that ha- that has strength and, and tries to stay ahead of the other. Siblings, but even before their birth, God declares this uh, prophetic message and um, this proclamation of the older will serve the younger. We see God's sovereign plan to say, listen, you're going to have these kids. One's going to come out before the other one because they're twins. And the one that comes out second, I'm that's the that's the my plan. God's plan is to work through that way instead of how man would normally have it be done. When the time came for her to give birth. There were twins in her womb. The first to come out was red. And his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau, which is believed to mean hairy. Awesome. I'm glad they don't name kids the same way now. All of us would be named ugly. So first come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. Hey, hairy. After this, his brother came out, listen to this, with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob, which means heel grabber or deceiver. It was a statement in that day to say, like, if you grab someone's heel, like, and you wouldn't literally grab someone's heel, but a heel grabber was like a deceiver. Hmm. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. So they're, they're... 20 years married at this point. And an interesting thing, uh, as far as Scripture goes, it's already told us that Abraham died earlier in this same chapter. Um, But as far as the timeline goes, Abraham still has 15 years left after the birth of his grandsons. Just a thing I thought, for me, that's fun to know. Um, Now you know. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. So Esau was seen maybe in that time and this time as more of a a manly man. He goes out among the fields and he goes and hunts, right? But Jacob is one that he was content with hanging out around in the tents and and being in that that kind of space um, for these twins. And so Isaac who had taste for wild game, loved Esau. It's kind of an interesting statement. Hey, he's the better hunter, and I like meat. <laughs> so I love him more. But Rebecca loved Jacob, which seems to make sense, right? Like he likes to stay at home a lot more with mom. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but, but this, is, this is what's going on here in Scripture. These twins are born. God says the older will serve the younger, which is interesting because the older is this manly guy that goes out and kills beasts to bring home and feed the family. And dad's like, I like him. <laughs> and, and, and Jacob hangs out around the tents more. He's more content with being in that area and staying home. And, and Rebecca loves him more. Okay. If you're taking notes, right? Birthright and bean stew. Or maybe exploitation and indifference. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, this is totally them fitting to the roles they just said in the scripture. Esau came in from the open country famished. So Jacob's staying home cooking. Esau was out 
hunting and comes home. And I'm not trying to say you're more of a man if you go out and do that stuff. I'm just saying as far as like stereotypes go, that's what the view is. And so Jacob's home. He's, he's cooking this bean stew. It's a lentil stew we'll find out later. And, and Esau comes in famished, exhausted from this hunt that he's on. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom, because that means red. This guy's two names were Red, Harry. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, I got jokes, but I'm going to keep them to myself. <laughs> Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. So his brother comes in. He's famished. He's exhausted. He says, like, I- I'm d- give me some of that. I'm dying. Like, cool, I get that you're hungry. Why don't you sell me your birthright first? You're the firstborn, and so there's rights that come with being the firstborn. And I know you're hungry, but you don't get any of this unless you give me your birthrights or sell them to me. And listen to this. He's exploiting his hunger. But at the same time, we see that Esau is indifferent about this right that he's been given as the firstborn. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. (laughs) Like, I get that you don't really care about it, but until you swear on it, you don't get to eat. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. or He didn't appreciate his birthright. That he was, he was given this um, birthright as the firstborn, and, and he didn't really care for it. The Bible would tell us in Hebrews 12, um, verse 16, uh, kind of starting partway through, it says, Or is godless like Esau, or unholy like Esau. So there's more to Esau than maybe what the Bible is even letting us know in the Old Testament. The New Testament would let us know that he's ungodly and unholy. Who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. And we'll get to this next part uh, in the next couple weeks. Afterward, as you know, or next week, afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. So, so far we see with Isaac, we see that he's the son of Abraham, that he's the one that it's established, the covenant is established through him. We, we see that he's the husband of Rebekah. And now we see that he's the father of Jacob and Esau. Jacob will eventually be Israel. His name will be changed. Jacob has some significant storyline. He wrestles with God, the Bible says. His sons will be the 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so God has this plan to work through this line. His, his, he sees it from a level that we don't see it. And so from here, Isaac says, like, I love Esau more because he gets meat for me. And God says, my plan is to work through the line of Jacob to do what I have established and, and, and decided. Okay, I just want you to see God's sovereign hand at work. If you're taking notes right, not again. Not again. Genesis 26, 1 through 10. Now, there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. <laughs> we'll get to why that's significant. Well, I'll tell you right now. Abraham, we're going to see um, in Genesis chapter 20, went to the same place. There was a king with the same name, and Isaac does the same thing. Just watch. It's... They say that because it's the same place with the same name for the king. It's either the same king or it's part of his family given the same name. So you know how in families we oftentimes name kids after other people in the families. We're not sure exactly what the time frame is between the time that Abraham goes to this place and does something that Isaac's about to do the same thing. But it's the same name of the same king and the commander's got the same name that the commander had then. So it's believed it's the same people. Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. So there's a famine, so he goes to this place so that he can be taken care of. And the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while. I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. 
He's restating the, the, the covenant that he made with Abraham, God is. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed. Because, this is awesome, Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. So Isaac stayed. God says, do what I tell you, stay here. And Isaac listened. But I think it's also awesome that there is this blessing and this covenant because of who his father is. That this covenant gets passed down because of Abraham's uh, full-on obedience, that he listened to him, obeyed all of his commands, and follows after God. And God says, like, because of who, who your father is in relationship with me, you're going to be blessed. Okay, just hang on to that for a minute. There's blessing and, and covenant that is passed on. When the men of that place ask him about his wife, so Isaac comes to this place, God reestablishes the covenant that he gave to his father. He, he's there with the, the king of Gerar, Abimelech, and he's there so that during this family he's taken care of. And when the men of that place ask him about his wife, he said, she is my sister. Because he was afraid to say she is my wife. He thought the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebecca because she is beautiful. In Genesis chapter 20, his dad, Abraham, went to Gerar where there was a king named Abimelech. And guess what Abraham did? He was afraid from the men of the city. And so he said that Sarah was his sister instead of his wife. In fact, at that time, Abimelech took Sarah into basically his harem to prepare her to be one of his wives, but hadn't touched her. And so thankfully, because he prays to God like, God, that why is there, I'm not guilty. No one touched her. And, and so we see this play out in Abraham's time. And now Isaac is following in the same footsteps and walking in the same kind of fear instead of believing that God will provide in that way. She is my wife. He thought the minute this place might kill me on the count of Rebecca because she is beautiful. I want to say this, and it just kind of jumped out at me because I have some boys and I think about the, what I do and how it affects them. That when God establishes his covenant with Abraham, he says, the reason that I'm giving it to you, Isaac, also, and it's through you is because of your dad. Because he obeyed me and walked with me and I promised to him, and so I'm going to do what I promised to him, and you get to be a recipient of the blessing of that. So we see this blessing passed on, but we also see some of his dad's bad habits passed on. That Abraham <laughs> goes, oh, this is my sister, because he's afraid. And now Isaac goes like, oh, this is my sister. Because he's afraid of what that'll look like. And it just shook me a little bit, because I thought, like, man, I've got to become everything God says that I am, so that what I pass on isn't some of the junk that I deal with. But it is the, the, what God has blessed me with, and I, I want to be able to, to obey all his commands, to walk in righteousness, realizing I can do none of it without his spirit indwelling inside of me and drawing me to himself. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. It's interesting, based on the translation there, it says laughing with his wife, Rebecca, but the word laughing is more intimate than just like laughing over a joke. And Isaac's name means to laugh. And so when he looks down, he sees her caressing, this says, but he sees Isaac being his true self. To laugh is what his name is. So it sees him intimately like with his wife. And that doesn't mean like physically or sexually intimately, but, but that he's he's open and he's him to her and so he sees this and goes like wait a second that's not his sister <laughs> so Abimelech summoned Isaac and said she's really your wife why did you say she's my sister Isaac answered because I thought I might lose my life on account of her then Abimelech said what is this you have done to us one of the men might well have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. Look, he didn't trust that he was taken care of. And Abimelech says, like, if you would have just told us it was your wife, no one would have touched her. And now we'll make sure that no one does. You, you almost uh, got us in trouble. And I want to show you something. The next verses, if you're taking notes right, protected and powerful. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people. Anyone who harms this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. That's nuts. He duped them. And the response of the king, instead of saying, like, I'm going to take you out for duping me, is nobody touch him or I'll kill you. Okay, that's God's sovereign hand working through someone. 
Watch it happen more. Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. That's a divine favor. That's a divine blessing. The Lord blessed him. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him, people around there. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. They're envious of the flocks and herds, and so they try to stop all these wells from producing water so he can't really survive off of them. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. I want to just show you something out of this before we move on to the rest of this story. It says that these things happen because the Lord blessed him. It's this divine blessing. It's a divine favor. Um, It's something not because of how great he is, but because God chose to bless him in this way. And I just want to just drive down um, home here that there is no boasting in something that God does. Did you hear me? Like nothing drives me more crazy than this statement Hashtag favor ain't fair. Maybe you've seen that. Favor ain't fair. So somebody has something cool happen and they'll like take a picture from this place because they got blessed with something. They're like, favor ain't fair. You arrogant little jerk. (laughs) Favor is not something you deserved. So it's not something you can boast in. It's something we'd be grateful for. That we should be humbled by. That Isaac here, it says that the reason that that, that, that there's a hundredfold return isn't because he's a great farmer. The reason that he has all these flocks isn't because he just knows how to make that happen. I'm not saying he didn't have a, a part that he played in what God had told him to do. But what I'm saying is when the Lord blesses, give credit to the Lord. That he has blessed you on purpose for a purpose for his glory that you would find joy in understanding what it is he's at work doing so that others don't feel like they're not blessed by God because you apparently you just get more favor even if you are favored in that way you need to understand it's not because of how great you are it's because of how great he is and that's not to diminish who you are but it's to just to help an understanding of the the gap of how great God is I just called somebody an arrogant jerk, I think. (laughs) So sorry for that, kind of, sort of. If we keep moving, uh, well then is the next point, well then. So Isaac moved away from there because he's too powerful and and he encamped in the valley of Gerar, which he was just in Gerar. And so this is kind of uh, run by the same people, but it's not in the the city. So it's outside of, it's the valley of Gerar where he settled. And Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father, Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. And he gave them the same names his father had given them. I love that. He's just following in his father's footsteps. He says, my dad dug these wells up. I'm digging them up. And he named them something call him that. Isaac's servant dug a well in the valley and discovered a, uh, or excuse me, dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herders of Gerar quarreled with those of Isaac and said, the water is ours. So there's basically these, these few w- wells that get dug up and water's a big deal where they're at. You need it to survive. Water's just a big deal wherever you're at. You need it to survive. And so they, they would dig up these wells and then there would be these issues between the herders of these animals and say like, no, that's our water. No, that's our water. So they actually named the wells based off of that. So um, the, the first one is named uh, contention and the next one is named enmity. He moved on from there and dug another well and no one quarreled over it. He named it uh, Rehoboth, which means broad places and rooms saying, now the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in this land. And we'll kind of get to the end of this chapter. Genesis 26, 23 says, From there he went up to uh, Beersheba, which means the well of seven or the well of oath. It's, it's at that place where his dad, Abraham, um, had made an oath with Abimelech uh, about a well. And so um, they named that well uh, the well of oath. And now there's this area around it. And that night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. I love that. 
if you're taking notes, I just call this point, worship, pray, settle, stay. Isaac built an altar there so that he could give offerings unto God. That he would worship him, showing that God, you are God and I'm grateful for everything that I have. And called on the name of the Lord, we would call that praying. So he worships and prays. There he pitched his tent, because they're sojourners, they're traveling people. He pitched his tent, so he decided to stay there for a while. And there he, his servants dug a well so they would stay for a while. While all that's happening, um, what happens is the king, Abimelech, who told him to get out of there because he's too powerful, shows up with a couple of his guys, his personal assistant and the commander of his army. Um, and it says, he, Isaac asked them, why have you come to me since you were hostile to me and sent me away? They answered, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you. Now, they specifically are talking about the blessings, the the tangible blessings that he received. They saw that, okay, your flocks multiply, you get a hundredfold. There's all of these goods that come to you. And it's not that God doesn't provide those things. He does. They were accurate in saying God was with you in that. So they came to make a treaty with him saying like, hey, you're really powerful. Remember how we were good to you? Be good to us. Let's make a covenant that you don't, mess with us. We don't mess with you. It's kind of, um, but I just want to say one of the things that hit me when I, when I saw that was, is it clear that God is with me? And I don't mean it necessarily from the way they're saying it there, because I don't mean because of the lavish things that we have. Like he had all this stuff. It's not like, oh, I have all this stuff. So now everybody knows God's with me because look at all my stuff. Because there's a lot of evil people that have stuff. But that regardless of circumstance, would I put out a light and would I show uh, uh, that the the presence of God is with me? See, because Job's friends, I don't know if you know the story of Job, but he loses everything. His friends come to him and be like, God must not like you. What'd you do? Because he lost everything. But really, God was with him the whole time. Like God was with him. He just allowed that these hard things would happen so that God would get more glory and that he would show that Job was his And so regardless if we see God with us clearly, we need to always constantly know that he is with us for those that have our faith in Christ Jesus. And I want to show him regardless of what way that is to show him. If it is because he abundantly blesses me, cool. If it is through broken times, awesome. Awesome. In fact, I think most times people see that as more authentic. Because a bunch of heathens that have good things happen on TV when they get an award say, thank God. They don't love God. A lot of people that don't love him thank him for just abundance of stuff. That we would say that, that I walk with God regardless of circumstance. My job is to be obedient. He's in control of outcome. So we said, so this is, so they answered, we see clearly that the Lord was with you. So we said, there ought to be sworn agreement between us, between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you that you will do us no harm, just as we did not harm you, but always treated you well and sent you away peacefully. And now you are blessed by the Lord. Isaac then made a feast for them, and they ate and they drank. Early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other. Then Isaac, Isaac sent them on their way, and they went away peacefully. That day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well that they had dug. They said, we found water! Exclamation point. It's a big deal. He called it Sheba, or Oath. And to this day, the name of the town has been Beersheba. So a couple things I want us to get from this, and uh, we'll close up service. Uh, One, next week, we'll talk about Isaac a little bit, but we'll really be talking about his sons. Um, And so next week, we're going to talk about Isaac's blind blessing. That Isaac, when he's old and can't really see, blesses his sons backwards because of some deceit. And how it's a big deal. And and even in the issues and the deception, God's plan works out. Because he works through things that we wouldn't think that he might work through for his glory and for his ultimate plan. Okay. And so the two things I hope that we grab from the story of Isaac today is, well, maybe three things. One, a better, clearer grasp on Scripture. 
and the big story that takes us all the way through Scripture that points to God, even in the brokenness of men, that his plan is greater. And that we get to be a part of that plan. And although we're a small piece in a big plan, we are significant in the piece that we play. The second thing is that, um, well, never mind. The first one was the grasp of Scripture. The second one was that. God's plan is bigger than us, that we should submit to it. And then the third thing is this. We pass on who we are to the next generation. Let's be everything that God has called us to be. And we desperately, like, when I pray for my boys, I'm praying that, that, that God would move in their life, that he would from a young age, protect them, be with them, save their souls, draw, him to them, draw them to himself. And a lot of what my prayers are aren't like, God, I'm so awesome, have them be like me. A lot of my prayers are, and God, the flaws that I have, don't let them catch. God, work these issues out in me that I could be a better example to what it be, is, is like to follow after you. And it's not just for my own kids, but we should long for that, that we would pass it on, that we would train up young men, young women to what it looks like, that we would disciple and say, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I'm not perfect along the way, but I'm following after the one that is perfecting me. And so that we would long as a church and as individuals to to just follow after God and, and submit our plans to him, realizing he is sovereign and that he works through all of it. Hmm. This is what I want to do. Uh, I want to pray for us. Uh, in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to worship too. So if, if you could stand with me for a moment while the worship team comes up here to the front. We're not going to be dismissed yet. Um, What's going to happen is I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing songs to God because he's worthy of all honor, all glory, all praise. And so we're going to sing songs to God and then after we sing for a moment, I'm going to come back up and talk a little bit about how we might respond to God today, um, what that might look like in our lives. And so don't go anywhere until after that point. Um, I want to make sure that we get used to being an active participant in in the body, in the church, that it's not just to come sit and listen to the worship team or sit and listen to Pastor Russ, but it's an engaged um, walk on on with God. And what does that look like? I want to respond to what God's doing in our lives corporately, and I want you to just respond to what He's doing in your life personally. We can't live our faith through someone else. It's It's our walk with God. So I want to pray for us and then we're going to worship. Like I said, don't go anywhere yet. God, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that in looking at Old Testament stories, we see that from the get-go you had a plan, a plan of redemption, that you would work through certain people and certain families to bring it to this place of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that, that we would put our faith in him God, ultimately, that we just believe that you have control of all things, that you are sovereign and you are powerful. And God, we are grateful that you have drawn us to yourself, that you have made a way for us to be forgiven of all sins, purified of all unrighteousness, and, and, and made righteous and whole and complete in you. Not because you had to, but because you chose to, because you love us. God, I pray that our response will be appropriate, that it will be grace-driven and spirit-led and faith-filled. God, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, let's sing.